Hi there, so this is a supplement to lecture four where we're going to dig deeper into the feasibility of learning. And why such a supplement? Because in our lecture four on the feasibility of learning, which reduces learning to this two-step process and asks you to fix a hypothesis set and it introduces the possibility of failure, all of this interesting stuff, you know, it's lots of questions and lots of discussion and, and it's great. I love these questions because you know, it, it indicates to me that you guys are really thinking about, you know, the, the feasibility of learning. And so let's address these questions. It's worth addressing these questions. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to look at five questions. The first is, you know, we, we formulated, you know, learning as this two-step process to make it feasible. Well, you know, humans, the greatest learners on the planet, do they follow such a rigorous two-step approach? Okay. It doesn't seem like they do. Question two. So there are these commercial tools out there. Okay. And you know, load the data, you explore a few features here and there, then you try one model, then you, then you try another model, and then you ultimately settle down on, 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 on what you want, and then it shows you all these nice statistics and pictures and so on and so forth. Well, don't these commercial tools know about fixed H and about this two-step process? I mean, what's going on? Okay. Question three. Okay. So, you know, and a very natural thing to do with a hypothesis set is, 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 to, is to think of the following setup. I search the hypotheses one by one. So I try H1, it fails. Fails means I don't, I, I don't get a good hypothesis. It doesn't have a good in sample error. H2 fails, H3 fails, four fails, five, ah, boom. I get close to in sample error zero. So I pick H5 and I'm done. Okay. Now, you know, I only tested five hypotheses. So it seems, it seems right that I should only pay the price in terms of the, you know, the generalization error bar that links E into E out for these five hypotheses I tested. Why do I have to pay the price for the full hypothesis set size? Question four. Okay. So, you know, typical thing that can happen in practice. I, I, I try a simple model like lines. It fails. It means it, it doesn't get good in sample error. Okay. Now I try a more complex model like circles. Succeed. Boom. Bingo. Okay. Now I do understand. I've tried lines and circles, so I have to pay the price for trying lines and circles. But is there anything wrong here? You know, what's wrong with that? So if I try circles, I'll, I'll pay the higher price. What's the big deal? Why can't I change the hypothesis set as I see, uh, 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 you know, if, if the first hypothesis set fails. Okay. And the last question we're going to sort of address, and this is, the, this is the most interesting one in some sense, the most subtle one, is what I call the supervisor's dilemma. So you've got Alice and Bob, they both work in some company, they have a supervisor, supervisor gives them a data set. Alice sits in her room, you know, comes up with her hypothesis set, and produces a hypothesis, final hypothesis G sub A. Bob does the same with his hypothesis set, produces G sub B. You know, uh, H A and H B were chosen so that, you know, you know, they can, they can uh, ensure the first step of learning E in is approximately equal to E out. Okay, but now when Alice looks at her training error, it's close to 0.5, basically random. So Alice fails. Okay, but when Bob looks at, at his error, G sub B, Bob's error is, you know, uh, close to zero. And he succeeds because he's, he's managed to do both steps, you know, E in close to E out and E in approximately equal to zero. Now, why did they choose these hypotheses set? Because that's what they needed to get E in close to E out. Okay, and if they chose chosen larger hypothesis sets, then, you know, um, um, they would have lost control of E in versus E out. So now the question is, can Alice and Bob collaborate? In other words, the supervisor can be viewed as the agent that enforces the collaboration in the following sense. The supervisor now can look at both Alice and Bob and, and G sub A and G sub B and pick G sub B. Okay. Now, what's the dilemma here? The dilemma here is that, you know, um, effectively, the supervisor has used the, the union of the hypothesis sets H sub A and H sub B, which means that, you know, he's lost control of E in and E out. And so even though G sub B has a, a, a good um, in sample error, it's the case that, you know, he has lost control of E in and E out. So he cannot establish the first step of learning. So he, the supervisor, concludes that he has failed. But Bob has concluded that he has succeeded. But they both have produced the same hypothesis G sub B. So how is it possible that Bob has succeeded and the supervisor has failed with the same hypothesis? Okay, so we'll answer these questions. Let's take them one by one. So first question, do humans follow this two-step process? So indirectly, yes. Okay. But they don't explicitly uh, implement this uh, E in approximately equal to E out. They are, humans are fitting machines. So think of it this way. When you're born, you have this sophisticated neural network in your, in your brain. And as you grow older, you, you, you change the synapses, the synapse weights, you, you reconfigure here and there. Basically what you're doing is your, 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 your ultimate, ultimately your neural network stays, stays fixed. So you have this huge complicated, you know, hypothesis set, which is allows you to represent reality in a variety of ways. And then you're gradually picking one of those ways as you get more and more experience. Okay? And that's what learning is. 
that's going on in the human. You're just rewiring your, your synapses to fit the representation of reality that you have seen. Okay? So you're co constantly maintaining E in approximately equal to zero. So humans have this tendency to maintain E in approximately equal to zero. You, know, you don't touch the cup of coffee, you, you, you learn how to walk, you don't step on the nail, you don't put your finger in the plug. You know, you're constantly you know, adapting your representation of reality to, to sort of fit the experience that you've seen. And, and because you have this fixed hypothesis set, you know, as you get more and more data, as you get more and more experience, i.e. as you get older and older, you're gradually accomplishing, because now the N in the error bar, the, the error bar is going up, the error bar is going down, okay, and so you're gradually getting E in close to E out. So you accomplish that second, the first step of this process, E in approximately E out, as you get more and more experience. Okay, and you can sort of see this in, you know, little kids, they do silly things, that's because they have sort of they have accomplished E in approximately equal to zero for their limited experience, small n, but the error bar is large. So when they actually apply this representation of reality to new, ex new, to, to, to new situations, they can do silly things. Um, you know, for example, my uh, um, uh, three-year-old, when, when, when he saw a tiger, he said, well, you know, you know, that's not a tiger, that's nothing different, you know, that's a zebra lion. Because the new zebra and lion is overfit, and that's all he has seen, and that's a that's a that's a that's a zebra lion. And then when he learns there's a, this thing called a tiger, now his representation gets better, and his e in will always stay close to zero, but he'll gradually be getting e in close to e out, accomplishing that first step. Okay. In fact, you know humans have the benefit once you learn to read, you have the benefit of you know vastly accelerating the rate at which you at which you you put you put data into your brain and, and reconfigure your neural network because you can learn about the experience of all kinds of other people through what you read and so you can actually now start getting a data set and you can actually learn from the experiences of all people in history through what was what what was written and said okay. and so you can rapidly improve your e into e out um, um, first step in learning okay so humans do indirectly do two-step learning Okay, so let's take the second question. Commercial tools, have they forgotten about fixing H? Have they forgotten about E out, the two-step approach? No. And it's important to understand that, the, um, that there's a very good reason for this. Because when you come to a commercial tool, you know, with uh, a data set, you know, they have no idea what you did with the data set before. Did you try this? Did you try that? Did you try this? Did you try that? So they have no idea. They have no idea what the union of hypotheses you might have tried. So they are not really gearing themselves towards giving you a handle on E out, which is what learning is. These commercial tools are mostly geared towards giving you efficient, convenient, GUI-based interfaces for minimizing E in. So they are explicit, they, they, they may not tell you that, but they're explicitly just giving you a, a mechanism for minimizing E in. Now, it's up to you to protect yourself and realize that you know there's this first step where I have to also ensure E out is approximately equal to E in. So you have to use these tools in a very careful, measured way so that you don't at will try this and this and this and this and then I get, keep getting more and more complicated until you get E in uh, approximately equal to zero. You've lost control of E in versus E out. Okay. So you, you can use these tools to conveniently and efficiently minimize E in, but you have to protect yourself with respect to E out. And they cannot you know, give you this link between E in and E out because they don't know what you did. So if they tried to, they would probably be telling you a lie. So you need to bear in mind exactly what you did, all the steps you did the moment you got the data. Okay. And, you know, and then uh, build a, a picture of how E out is related to E in. Okay. And so you need to sort of understand the limits of you know, your ability to reach from in to out based on how many different, let's say, hypothesis sets that you try. And you have to limit yourself. The commercial software is not going to do that for you. Okay, so uh, question three is an interesting one. Sequential search through the hypothesis set H. So you have, let's say you have a thousand hypotheses. You, you try hypothesis one, H1, you try H2, H3, H4, H5, bingo. H5 got zero in sample error. So you pick that and then you ask, well, what's my error about? And you're wondering, why do I have to pay the price for all 1,000 hypotheses when I only tested five? Okay, so now it's important to understand we've, we've done a probabilistic analysis. Okay, and when you do a probabilistic analysis, it's important to sort of be very clear on what have you computed the probability of and you know, you know what's the experiment okay. and so on, on the right is the 1000 monkeys corresponding to the 1000 hypotheses and here's the experiment here's the question we're trying to answer so 
Look, you administer a five question multiple choice A-B test, okay? And you, you see if, you know, you know, some door got all five correct or so in sample error zero, and you pick that, and then you, 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 know, you, know, you think that you've got a genius and you ask them to build a rocket to the moon and then the rocket crashes, okay? And it's because you've got the monkey. Okay. And so, so the experiment we're trying to un we're, we're trying to analyze is when you when you when you perform this test on these thousand you know monkeys, what are the chances that one of them will get you know everything correct? Okay, and because that's the situation where you are in probability, where, where you are in trouble. If if any monkey gets all the questions correct, okay, you are in trouble. Okay, and that's that's what the Hofting analysis gives us. It, it gives us an upper bound on the probability that you are in trouble, not just for this scenario, but for any scenario. This happens to be a pretty bad scenario where everything, all the monkeys are bad. Okay. Now, you can be in a much better scenario where, where the chances of getting in trouble are much lower if, if you had all good hypotheses. But the Hofting bound has to take care of all situations, including this one. Okay. So that's the experiment that the Hofting bound gives a probability for. The probability that you will be in trouble, which is essentially the probability that some monkey appears to look smart. Okay. And in the event that some monkey appears to look smart, it doesn't matter in, you, you know, how you find that monkey, whether you start on the left and go to door 5, whether you start on the right and come all the way down to door 5, you know, whether you look at them all at once and, and, and pick door 5. So, so, so the ex you're still in trouble no matter how you pick that that monkey because it's the same experiment and on the left is the same is this experiment with five monkeys now you it, the Huffington says you're it's much less likely that you're going to be in trouble okay. so the important thing is you know it's it, the experiment we're analyzing is what are the chances that you will be in trouble okay and the Huffington bound has to give a bound on that probability no matter what the specific details of this experiment are, experiment are. in particular you know it could be all monkeys in which case you know any if any one of the bins come off bad, you are in trouble. Okay. And, 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 and sort of the, the, the sort of summary here is that, you know, when, when, you, when you talk about worst case analysis, which is what the Hufting bound gives you, it gives you a bound no matter what the situation. When you talk about this worst case analysis, okay, the price you pay is, not, is for the options that you had available, not the options that you used. And so even though you just, it might appear that you used just five options by testing H1 through H5, you, you had a thousand options available. And it's those thousand options with respect to which you're doing this experiment and trying to understand how likely is it that you will be in trouble. Okay. And, and the chances are very high that you will be in trouble. Okay. And that's what the Hafting bound is telling you if you started with a thousand monkeys. Okay. And if you started with five monkeys, the chances are not very high that you will be in trouble. That's what the Hafting bound is telling you. Okay, so the fourth question is also interesting. This is sometimes what's called repeated hypothesis set testing. So you try a simple model like lines first, it fails. So now you try a more complex model like circles, it succeeds. So that's called you repeatedly tested, you know, lines and then circles. Okay, and you know, most, uh, you know, practitioners and, and, and so on know that when you do repeated hypothesis testing, you, and, and, and now you've come to try circles, you, you have to pay the price for this added power. And you may have lost the E in versus E out, you know, generalization guarantee. Okay. Um, so what's wrong with this? You're paying the price when you do this repeated hypothesis test. And this is the subtlety. And this is what's going to make you guys the experts. Okay. Which is to realize that this is essentially the same game as the one we discussed in, in question three, which is the sequential selection of hypotheses. You pay for the options you had available, not for the options that you ultimately ended up using. So the, the, the subtlety comes when, when you try the linear model and it succeeds. Now, you know, the mistake that occurs here is to say, oh, well, I only tried the linear model and it succeeded. So, you know, I've got E in close to zero and I only pay the error bar price for this smaller model, this simple linear model. That's exactly the same argument that we tried to use in the in, in question three. I only tested hypotheses one, two, three, four, five, so I should only pay the price for hypotheses one, two, three, four, five. So Hufting bar, Hufting error bar with hypothesis set size five. So this is exactly the same situation, except you've just bunched up a whole bunch of hypotheses into the linear, and then the the, the complex come later. So you can't make that argument. Okay. The the correct argument is to say I'm I'm doing an experiment. And what's my ultimate experiment? My ultimate experiment is, you know, I'm going to try linear. If it succeeds, I'm done. If it fails, I try circles. And, and, and then if that succeeds, I'm, I'm, I'm done. If that fails, I fail. Okay. 
Okay, and 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 so the real stopping condition here is the union hypothesis set. And you are asking yourself the question, and that's what the Hafting era bar gives you. What are the chances that you get in trouble for that experiment, that full experiment? Okay, and you know. If the linear model worked, you still have to pay the price for the fact that you had the choice to go into the complex uh, circle model. Okay. You still have to pay that price. And that's what most people don't realize. Okay. Even though it looks like I, I stopped at the linear model, you have to still pay the price for, for what you would have done had you failed. Now, if you had failed, you said, I, I actually failed with the linear model, then you, you are correct in applying you know, the, only the linear model uh, Hufting error bar. Okay, but you, 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 the way you should think about this is, I'm doing an experiment, what are the chances I get in trouble? Okay. And, and that's what the error bar protects you against, the chances that you get in trouble from this experiment. Okay. And you're going to get in trouble, you know, if by luck you, 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 you got a good example with the linear model, or if by luck you got a good example error with the... Um, um, more complex model. It's that or. It's that or. It's still the or, even though you're, you're evaluating your A or B from left to right. Okay. Um, and so that's the trick. To re and that's why it's so important to fix your hypothesis set ahead of time because that sets the stopping condition. It sets the boundaries around which you say you fail. And you know, you've got to look at all the hypotheses that are available to you until the point that you say you fail. Okay, and the uh, last question, which is in some senses the most in interesting question, which is the supervisor's dilemma. So, what's going on here? You know, Alice succeeds, I mean, sorry, Alice fails, Bob succeeds. The supervisor picks Bob, but then when he applies the union bound, uh, applies the Hufting error bar for the union hypothesis set, he finds that E in is not close to E out, so he declares he failed. Okay. And so, how is it possible that Bob says, I succeeded? And, you know, supervisor says, I failed, but it's the same hypothesis that they are talking about. Okay, and that's where you have to realize the important um, thing again is to, is, is, to, is, is, to, is to sort of realize that this is a probabilistic analysis. And the moment we became a probabilistic analysis, that's when all these subtle things occur. Now, if Bob's guarantee was deterministic, then sure. Okay, then the, 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 the hypothesis G sub B is good, it's good, it's 100% sure, but it's not sure. And so, you know, it's a probabilistic uh, guarantee and it's a probabilistic guarantee for a particular experiment that Bob performed. And, and so, so given the sort of parameters, given the information available in that experiment, the, the probabilistic analysis says it's low probability that you fail or it's high probability that you succeeded. In other words, E in is close to zero, E in is close to E out. Okay. Now, the supervisor is doing a different experiment. And so the supervisor is asking the question, in my experiment, what are the chances that I fail? Okay. And I will fail with a higher probability because, you know, I have these more choices. And so, you know, it's possible for, even though Bob and, and, and the supervisor are, are talking about the same hypothesis, they're talking about the same hypothesis that resulted from different experiments. And so the probabilistic uh, bound, the probabilistic analysis of those different experiments those different random experiments is going to be different. And that's why they have different, they have, they have their own separate conclusion. Bob thinks, based on, on his experiment, that he succeeded. Okay. And for his experiment, most of the time he will have succeeded. Okay. But the supervisor is doing a different experiment, and most of and most of the time he will have failed. That's what the Hufting bound with this new union of hypotheses tells the supervisor. 